Welcome to Happy Talks with Dr. Alice and Donovan. Dr. Alice Fong is a holistic naturopathic doctor and founder of Amour de Soi Wellness. And Donovan Jensen is a software engineer and founder of HowToHappy.com. Together, they're out to cause more happiness in the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Happy Talks. My name is Dr. Alice, and this is my awesome co-host, Donovan. And today I have a special guest, Sean Wickens, who is a retired New York City window washer and an award-winning comedian. So I'm excited for some fun conversation and laughs, hopefully. <laughs> Please welcome Sean. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, I hoping, I'm hoping as well for some laughs. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Great. Excellent. So tell us a little about your story and your background of like you've done all sorts of things and what led you to to being a comedian and all the other stuff you're up to. Uh, sure. Well, it's pretty quick, um, but I think I really think that I became a comedian because I going through my life would just say things not trying to be funny and people for some reason started laughing. And then they encouraged me to become a comedian. And I think this really is the trajectory of a lot of comedians is that you um, made people laugh without trying to laugh. And then once you were told you're good at this and you tried to pursue it, you realized that trying to make people laugh didn't work. Mm. And so you had to then learn. Comedians are just learning to not try too hard to make people laugh. That's really what mm. takes takes long. Uh, and so that's where I am. I'm, I'm at a point where I think I'm pretty good at not trying to make people laugh. I'm pretty good at letting people laugh. That's cool. That's a cool, you know, sort of way to frame it because I feel like uh, I, I've known a handful of people who've tried their hand at it and yeah. uh, it hasn't gone successfully for them. But I also know that they've been trying their asses off like very, very in their head, like, okay, I got to make sure that this joke is perfect and it kills and then they go to an open mic, which is probably why open mics are historically not the, the the best all the time. But, you know, they go to it, this joke that they haven't really worked out or whatever, expected to be perfect. Uh, and they're trying so hard. And I feel like a lot of times you can like feel it in the delivery. Oh, yeah. It's like you're trying so hard and it just doesn't land. Yeah. Well, I'm a believer that everyone is funny because I don't know, everyone's made somebody laugh. And that's true since you were a baby. Like every baby has made some adult laugh. You know what I mean? So it's like, so the ability to be funny is, is in us. And, you know, some people want to pursue it, some people don't. But the, the mystery of it is, you know, how hard do you pursue making people laugh? You know what I mean? And I think you can strangle it by wanting it too hard. I, um, I think I'm funny because my dad is funny. That's the truth. And I want to talk about, I want to, I just spent some time with my dad and stepmother in Ohio. I went to visit them, but um, can I tell you a story about my dad? Of course. Dr. Allison Donovan. Okay. <laughs> my dad for the past few, why do I, why was I also a window cleaner? I think I'm, a, I've acquired weird jobs because my dad is somebody who's acquired weird jobs. And the last three censuses, he's worked the censuses and um, mm -hmm. Whenever I go visit him, he always does this, but he takes me on a tour while in the midst of running his daily errands. He will point out the houses where people live who did weird things to him while he was on the census, <laughs> which I think, oh. I think my dad should start a side business. He lives in a tourist town. There's, he lives near an amusement park, but I think he should start a side business where he takes people on tours of his weird census neighbors. <laughs> I think it would be a hit. That would be that would be fascinating for me to know about my neighbors in a weird way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But it's not even, you know, because he lives in a tourist town, like oh, people are there visiting. Right. Yeah. I think it's just I think it's still a fun thing. And I even think it would if I lived in a neighborhood where I knew there was a tour where weird people were getting pointed out, I think it would make me be on my a better behavior a little bit <laughs> i wouldn't want to be i wouldn't want to be known as a weird neighbor was there anything that like that was really super weird that stands out in your mind uh it was a lot of aggressive people of oh. you know sort of like i don't want to be count counted by the government in, in which yeah. i live within its borders of you know that kind of thing um 
Actually, you'd have to take the tour from him. I can't do the tour justice. <laughs> sure, yeah. Hey, we save the plugging towards the end. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Cool. I'd be curious, um, you know, sort of, it sounds like the comedy piece is, is one major part of what you've been working on. Obviously this is a show, you know, happy talks about happiness. Oh, I'd sure. be curious how you feel sort of those two pieces intersect. It should be, well, it might be a softball. Seems like it might be, but <laughs> curious on your take there. Oh yeah. Well, you know, Comedy is a trap in some ways because in the pursuit of wanting to make people laugh, we can become miserable by the fact that we're not at a point in our lives that we want to be, you know? Um, so I will say personally, pre pandemic, I was a lot less happier than I am now. And I will credit that with during the lockdown here in New York, I had to live by myself and I had was forced to like learn to love myself a little more. Uh, and I think I'm a better comedian than I was before the pandemic. And that's not because I'm funnier. I think it's because I'm a happier person. Mm. Well, that's good to hear. What was there? <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, and I'm not trying to brag that I like myself. You know what I mean? uh, that's pretty cool. Is there anything in particular that like, that helped you kind of transform into a happier person in that process? Um, you know, I had some difficult times during the, the uh, lockdown and I'm, I live alone. And so I was kind of isolated. Yeah. So I did a lot of reading about um, neuroplasticity mm -hmm. and changing mindsets. And, uh, you know, I read some self-help things. Uh, I wrote the, the four, what's that book? The Four Truths or something. Four uh, Agreements? Four agreements. That one? Yes. Oh, Four that's agreements. a good one. I love yeah. yeah. <laughs> I read that. I even, you know, urged friends to read it and I recorded myself reading it out loud hmm. and made it available to some friends asking that if they, you know, I did some, admitting to doing some copyright. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I shared myself reading it. I, I read it to read it to myself out loud because it's like, I wanted to reaffirm it. I re I reread it to myself out loud. I recorded myself doing it because I was like, you know, I'll share it with friends. You know, um, pay it forward. Not my recording, but the the you know, plug the book on their on their behalf. Um, anyways, so like, I just had to like learn to be cooler with me, um, and you know, meditating and reading about self improvement was was part of it. I also I was kind of underemployed and so I started walking dogs in my neighborhood. I think just being around dogs was oh, uh, yeah. useful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually speaking of dogs, I I saw in your in your description you had wrote that you're working on a stand-up comedian or comedy album geared towards dogs. Oh. So I, I just am curious. I love dogs. Yeah. Uh, so I have well, two that's... of my own. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm far, I'm not as far as long, along on this as I thought I would be, but the premise is that I'm just going to record myself. I'm going to do it at home. I don't need an audience for this, but I'm going to record uh, an album for dogs that people can play for their dog when they're away at work. <laughs> and, you know, it's just me sort of like talking about like, you know, what a good boy you are. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, it's good to be a good boy and uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, I, I, I have one track in mind where I will just sort of share my own feelings of what, what I think dogs dream about, um, that kind of thing. And it's, uh, you know, humans can listen to it if they want to, but it's more for, for dogs to chill out. I think I want to become such a good dog walker that I want dogs I haven't met yet to recognize my voice. I think that's really the <laughs> that goal. Would be famous to dogs. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, I think I have a pretty calming voice. Uh, I think it's maybe more geared to dogs than humans, perhaps. Maybe my frequency is, is a good dog level. Um, anyway, but yeah, I'll put out that album pretty soon. That, this is good. Um, you've given me good motivation <laughs> awesome. to do I that. Can't wait for it to come out because I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll let my dogs 
be the judge. <laughs> Definitely. I think it'll be called play this for your dogs. <laughs> nice. Yeah. Nice. Uh, Donovan, no dogs in your life. And I, no. you know, I don't, I don't own dogs myself. So it's like no judgment. No, no, we've got a, we've got a cat here at this house, which I would say, uh, was grandfathered in because it's my girlfriend's cat. We did not get it together, you know? Oh yeah. Um, other than that, it's a minimal pet policy over here. Just mainly, you know, for the same reason, I don't have kids uh, yeah. living things. They, they defecate and you got to take care of them, yeah. uh, clean them or like keep them from getting into dirt and whatnot. I can barely do that for myself. So, yeah. I have not quite same, ready. I have the same rule for myself for pets and humans, but I currently have two temporary roommates with me, a guitarist friend and a comedian friend who are in between jo uh, jobs and, and apartments. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they're crashing with me at the moment and I have cats living here. Um, I've, to I've started torturing the cats, not physically, but I'm trying to tell start. them. Yeah. I'm trying to explain to these cats what money is and how money works <laughs> mm -hmm. and they hate it. It's torture for most humans too. So it's a, it's <laughs> it is. Yeah. But the cats don't get it. I don't think they understand. So I keep on trying to explain to them. And actually this is not true. This is a joke. <laughs> But I'm uh, one of my friends who lives here. We invented a game called Mind Wars. And um, uh, the point of Mind Wars is to uh, um, it's a stupid game. The point of Mind Wars is to uh, forfeit uh, and neither of us will forfeit. But I keep on telling her that I'm torturing her cats by um, telling them that I'm trying to explain what money is. And it's, I'm not doing it. But this is a Mind War thing for her just to make her think that I'm verbally torturing her cats. I'm not, I'm verbally torturing her with this game, Mind Wars. It's a dangerous game. We should, I shouldn't have talked about it. <laughs> it's called, it's caused fights. A pretend verbal uh, game has, has actually led to actual fights, but the fights have led it to good discussion with my temporary roommates who are just gonna be here for another two weeks or maybe a month. Um, so that's more about me. Yes, I used to be a window cleaner here in the, in New York. <laughs> On that note, here's a here's a related question I've got. Okay. Um, you know, so we've talked about comedy sort of being the the main main dig. Yes, I know that's not necessarily the easiest career path. So I would be sure. uh, curious, sort of, what drew you in and kept you on that path, right? Because you said you know, sort of, you feel like there's a way that a lot of people get into it, but I yeah. also imagine quite a lot of people go on the off ramp too and, and don't keep pursuing it. Oh yeah. Well, um, I've tried to quit before. So before I was a stand-up comedian, I was an improviser and I, I, I did a lot of improv comedy here in New York and I, you know, did some stuff on the road and I tried quitting. And when I quit, I then had people ask me if I could teach classes oh. and I was like, okay, well I can do that. And, Teaching made me miss performing, so I went back into it. Um, and uh, so that's part of the reason I'm still in it. I have enough sort of like, even though we go through moments where we feel we've failed, I've had just enough wins to sort of keep me back in and stay encouraged to, to keep at it. Um, I'll, I'll bomb one night but I'll just try within that set where I bombed, I'll just try a random joke that comes to me in the moment and it, and it crushes and it saves the, sh the set. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, great. Now I have another perfect joke that I'm going to have to tell more often. Mm -hmm. I also, so I also teach comedy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I realized recently is that I have become, I'm at a point where I'm not afraid if I forget a joke, Mm -hmm. That's a, that's every comedian's fear that they'll think of a joke and then forget it before they get an opportunity to write it down and it'll be gone. I'm never afraid of forgetting a joke like that anymore because I know I'll eventually write a joke that I'll think is better than the one that I forgot. Mm. Um, and this all came about through dog walking, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Who would have thought? Yeah. Yeah. I could see like, you know, I think I could be funny on occasion, but just being funny, like 
expect having an expectation that I have to be funny on stage in front of people is, is oh. another ball game, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it might have sounded like I was joking at the beginning of this when I said I got into, into this because I wasn't trying to be funny and people started laughing. Yeah. I think there's truth to that because we've all experienced moments in our lives when we've tried to make people laugh and it's worked and it feels good but then there's moments when we're not trying to make people laugh and people start laughing and we feel self-conscious about that mm, yeah uh it's fun to make people laugh but it's also difficult to be laughed at because you don't know sometimes why people are laughing you don't know if they're laughing with you or at you mm, mm -hmm. that's why that's why comedy is also dangerous <laughs> <laughs> so i sound like we're it sounds like you have to develop like a thick skin though and almost you know i actually just went to a comedy show maybe like a month ago it was a showcase with you know maybe like 10 different comedians for oh, just yeah. a few minutes at a time yeah and uh and some were were awesome some weren't but um but now i have like more empathy <laughs> for them. so who knows what was going on with them oh yeah, but, uh, <laughs> I, yeah the, I, oh go ahead one of the best descriptions i heard between the difference of music mm -hmm. and comedy is I was on the road and I did an open mic in Rochester, New York. And the host, his name is Chris, I forget his last name, but he said he made an announcement to the bar before the open mic started. And he said, I want everyone to know that there's going to be a comedy show here. This is an open mic. It's a practice for the comedians. Mm. And what makes it so special is that if musicians perform for you, they've practiced alone and they're showing you what they've mastered alone. Comedians can't practice alone. They have to practice in front of people. Right. Uh, and it was a great way to tell the audience what they were going to see. And like, everybody did well. It was like what, a, such a fun night. Um, and then I've done open mics that Donovan has said that are, are horrible. And it's not fun to do those horrible ones, you know? Mm -hmm. um, it's not fun to want to be funny and then live in those rooms where it feels like comedy is not allowed to exist. Mm. Ugh, it's like, <laughs> it's not fun even thinking about it. Have yeah, you so developed, oh God. Oh no, go ahead. <laughs> I was just curious because like, okay, if, if you're average Joe and you go, or at least I've had this experience where I try to make a joke or I say something that I think is funny and then yeah. it falls flat and it feels horrible. Right. And I imagine if if you're more intentionally sort of like setting out to make people laugh and it, and it bombs and it feels horrible. Um, have you developed any sort of like strategies to, to sort of like cope with the emotional problems? Is it the same every single time? Like you just sort of lick your wounds and, and deal with it. I, I'm just curious how, like how that's developed. Yeah. I've done enough good shows over the years and bad shows over the years that I've realized sometimes when you do incredibly well, you walk off stage and the feeling of winning leaves you pretty quickly. Mm. Like the, the successes, mm. they kind of, you know, you walk off the stage and it's over and it, it you don't feel as great anymore but you got to feel great when you were on stage so it's sort of like just get over the the weirdness of it mm -hmm. and so i think that helps with bombing as well of like you're gonna have to get over the failure yeah. because sometimes you're gonna have to get over the win because the win doesn't feel as 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 huge as you wanted it to mm. So it yeah. sounds like uh, to me, it's sort of like an emotional roller coaster. And once you, once you allow yourself to sort of settle into that, like, okay, this is, this is the journey I'm going on. Yeah. That helps to some degree. And I don't know, I'm kind of blessed to live temporarily with two friends who are crashing here um, and who keep on apologizing for being here. I'm like, whatever, it's the summer. <laughs> you both need a spot, whatever. Um, but I don't know. We've had a lot of like cool discussions about creativity and just sort of being more mature creators. And we have like small freak outs, you know, like they both are in the midst of like, you know, they're looking for jobs and looking for places. And it's like scary. And I keep on saying like, stop 
feeling panicked when you're doing this because it's like, you're fine here. You know, I left and visited family for two weeks. So, so it's like, it's not like we've been living on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, I'm probably heading out pretty soon anyway, also. So it's like, don't feel panicked. Like we felt panicked for two years during uh, the pandemic, which it is frustrating that so many discussions around this have turned political because it's like, can't we just agree that the last two years were weirder than the <laughs> two decades that preceded it? Um, let's just agree on that and then figure out where to go from there. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to live less from a state of panic um, post pandemic because uh, I, for my whole life came off as very calm and sort of Zen, but I don't know, underneath, I was always kind of panicked and I wasn't honest about it. So now I try to be honest about the minimal times that I panic, you know, <laughs> once a day <laughs> instead of constant. Hmm. What kind of, um, I don't know, what kind of new things have you been up to <laughs> since, uh, you know, over the last year and a half? Podcast yeah. wise or other Lots of things. We actually yeah. started this podcast. We were just telling someone that we just started this podcast right before. Well, the pandemic technically already started, but um, oh yeah, it did. It wasn't like big in the U.S. yet. Mm, uh, so yeah. it, we started a few months, like in January of 2020, and so oh yeah. <laughs> so we've been doing this for uh, a like two and a half years now, and yeah. uh, hopefully it's contributed to people's happiness and sense of well-being but a lot of zoom calls that's what i've been <laughs> doing lately oh yeah yeah well one thing that i've also sort of stumbled into is that you know people always talk about balance in life mm -hmm. and um you know we see so much about like positive thinking which is which is very great yeah but um i think it needs to be balanced with like asking for help or like little cries for help mm -hmm. you know what i mean like um uh I, don't know, I was lucky enough to have some friends like when i was going through rough times like force their um uh presence on me <laughs> and stop <laughs> by and like yeah. see how i was doing um and i was too afraid to ask for that which mm -hmm. is ridiculous mm -hmm. I was trying to th think positively, but I wasn't um, crying for help enough. Yeah, I feel like that's such a common trap that people get stuck in as they're trying to like improve their their life and well being and whatnot. Is you know you read all these books or see all this stuff about like like you're saying like positive thinking or all these other exercises that you can sort of do on your own. But like yeah. our lived experience is not just the world inside of our head. You know, there's like how our environment's set up. And like you are saying, how, how people come in and out of our lives and like interacting with people in a way that also bolsters your well-being, I don't think is super natural for a lot of people, or at least, you know, in the circles I run in, it's very common to like, oh, you know, I need help, but, but I saw in a book somewhere that I could maybe do this on my own in my head. So I'm going to mm. try that for six months and have it not work and right. keep trying that instead of just ask my buddy to go hang out, which is what I really need. So I think that's, that's like, it's such a common trap for people to fall into. Right. Right. Um, I, I, I feel like I've lucked out in that. I'm, that's like a lesson that I'm relearning, uh, you know, in adulthood. And I, I don't know, I think I'm around a bunch of, I think I have a bunch of friends who have separate circles of friends that they're tight with people they grew up with coworkers. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it, it's easy to get scared about what's going on in the world, but like, I don't know, sometimes I'm macro scared and macro anxious, but I'm kind of micro optimistic. <laughs> Cause I just witness a lot of like great interactions that I'm not even involved with. I was walking down the street, you know, I live in New York. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's, it's a benefit to live in a crowded place. I don't know, like I, around the holidays, it's so nice here because even you know, I don't have a family, but I'm around people who are celebrating with their family. Mm -hmm. It just feels nicer. Um, it's, I don't know, people complain about how New York is crowded. I think it's great that people are here. Uh, but the other day I was walking down the street and I saw two, I think they were probably coworkers. Maybe they used to work 
with each other at a previous job. I don't know. There was like a reunion on the street and these dudes just hugged. They like lit up and smiled when they recognized each other. I don't, I, I don't know. I get to see that a lot in New York. Yeah, that sounds great. And I, I know for myself when I'm feeling low uh, and I've learned this about myself, similar to you, that even though I might not want to be around people because I don't want to be like the Debbie Downer. Yeah, um, I know even I have to like get over myself and and talk with them and connect with them because I know it's going to make me feel better, even though I don't uh, feel yeah. like doing it. I know it will. So yeah. I, I do it anyways. And uh, it definitely makes a big difference for sure. Yeah. Here's a revelation that I had over the past year. Mm. And it's that, um, you know, as I was trying to improve some things about myself, you know, it was difficult. And then I would see you know, improvement. Um, anyway, I think I realized that a lot of times people will uh, postpone self-improvement because they somehow inherently know once you do get better, you will also, it comes with the knowledge that you could have done this sooner. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, the whole analogy of pushing a boulder is getting it started is more difficult than than, you know, after it's rolling. I think with self-improvement comes with the guilt that like we could have tried sooner sometimes. Mm. And and what that also means with like interacting with other people, I think we're we feel guilty about sharing successes because we don't want to make other people feel bad. Mm -hmm. So we, you know, so misery loves company. Right. Um I am funnier on stage. <laughs> <laughs> I know you said we were hoping for laughs. We, we've had a few, yeah, but uh, yeah. Yes. No, expect I shouldn't have even put it out there. It's just like, no, it's better I when mean, it's like not expected. <laughs> I mean, we have to talk about it. I said I presented myself as a comedian, so it's like I have to then be funny. I, could, I can't have lied. I feel like it's when I, I don't make music much anymore, but I used to do some some rap music stuff. I feel uh, like it's the same thing where it was like, yeah, I make rap music every once in a while. And every time people be like, freestyle, freestyle right now. And it's like, uh, I mean, like I am, you know, potentially capable of that, but like, I don't really want to. Yeah. Uh, I imagine with comedy, uh, you have to run into the same thing every once in a while. It's like, oh yeah. And a stand-up comedian it's like, tell me a joke. Tell me a joke right now. Oh yeah. <laughs> and I treat it as a challenge as to how to um, handle those interactions well. And so mm -hmm. I came up with a joke that always works in that situation. And uh, when somebody comes up, when somebody finds out a comedian and they say, oh, tell me a joke right here, mm -hmm. right now, I say, okay, 80 people walk into a bar. But in order for you to get this joke, I'm gonna have to tell you a little something about each person. And then I, eventually it gets to a joke because then if, even if I have to start describing one person, <laughs> they are living with the fear that their request for me is going to waste so much of their time. <laughs> oh, clever. And um, so that I think, I never tell that joke on stage because I had to f learn that I had to have a joke for real life to get myself out of those situations. I have a joke for if I ever get pulled over by a state patrolman for speeding, mm -hmm. I have a joke to get out of that. People want to know what it is, and I'm like, well, it's not going to be funny because it's not in that situation. <laughs> it's only funny for that situation. Um, You're much better sport about it than I am. Whenever, uh, whenever it used to happen to me, I'd be like, what do you like to do for fun or or for your career? Oh, you're a uh, pilot? Find me somewhere right now. <laughs> Give me an appointment. Oh, yeah, Let's yeah. go. Let's go. Oh, no, you can't do it right now or you don't want to? Oh, oh. but, you know, I, I'm a little bitter. You, you seem a little bit better natured about it well i have advice for you then if you want some unsolicited advice always okay next time somebody says oh freestyle in front of me right now you can say okay but i'm a roast freestyler mm. and so i'm gonna freestyle a roast of you and it might hurt but i'm gonna do it and then they might want not want you to <laughs> or they might be ready to and their excitement for it mm -hmm. might inspire you to do it I also, I also borrow. Oh, good. Oh, I, I also teach comedy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I might also borrow sort of your strategy and be like, okay, but, but my freestyles are 45 minutes. So. Oh yeah. That's good. That works too. <laughs> you got to stay for the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of teaching comedy, I had a question around um, when you mentioned it before, yes. you know, I'm sure you get some real curmudgeons that say like, can't teach comedy. It's not the kind of thing that you could teach. Uh, oh, yeah. I'm curious where, where, where you take that one. I'm sure that's common. Um. I usually say that everybody has made somebody laugh. So everybody is kind of funny. Um, you just kind of have to, you know, a lot of times the reason people aren't funny is because I think we, we're, we're given so much advice about how to be funny and they kind of, for them, there's a secret for every, there's a unique secret for everybody. And I think people use the, the wrong tactics for them to be funny. Um, so you, you kind of just have to sort of encourage people to figure out how to be funny for themselves. And it's a difficult thing to do because people will fight you on like, if they're taking a class because they want to be funny, they obviously aren't happy with their level of success about being funny. So something needs to change. But then when you point out what possibly needs to change, they fight you on it. Because mm -hmm. they don't want to believe that there's something that they have to change. Uh, <laughs> so how do you deal with that then? Um, well, for improv, I trick people into doing scenes that um, ends up being funny and I don't tell them why I'm giving them this exercise. Mm -hmm. oh. um, like a lot of times I'll do something in groups where I'm, when I say, mm -hmm. all right, two people are going to play a scene. I want them to each play an inanimate object, hmm. but more human than inanimate object. So if you're given mug, I want to see more human than mug. Mm -hmm. And it's such a stupid thing to focus on that they're focusing on that instead of trying to be funny. And then, so once you do that and then show them that that was successful, you kind of talk about why that worked. It wasn't really that you were trying to be a mug. It was that you weren't trying to be funnier than the other person. Um, essentially with improv, you're trying to get people to compete, to, to um, cooperate rather than compete. Mm -hmm. And I think for stand up, you're trying, uh, I don't know, I don't know how to put it for stand up. It's, a, it's a, an elusive thing. Mm. Do you help them like find their their own style? Because you know, when I go to like a showcase of comedians, it's like, mm -hmm. all of them have their own very unique set. Some like are really crude. Sometimes yeah. I like it, sometimes I don't. I And what kind of comedy I like uh can vary too some some of them are just making fun of themselves the whole time yeah or just like pointing out funny things about like relationships or life <laughs> so, yeah yeah a lot of times for beginners i'll encourage them to start with boring truthful stories about themselves mm -hmm. and and don't worry about trying to make it funny like you'll figure out how to make it funny yeah um and that came from like an acting class that I had where, you know, when the instructors told me a lot of times you're trying to, as a director, convince certain actors to be more boring and, and convincing certain actors to be less boring. Huh. Take it down a little bit or give me a little bit more. Um, so I think if you encourage uh, new comedians to just like be boring and be yourself, once you'll get more comfortable on stage quicker. And then once you're comfortable on stage, finding the funny, I think, comes easier. Do you feel like, or are there also um, particular strategies that you try to hammer in on? Or is it mostly the, the, the work around sort of figuring out the authenticity? I'm just wondering if there are more technical pieces or if it's not really like much of that. Um, I'm kind of a big believer in sort of like you have to kind of do laps um and you know like i said with the analogy earlier the musician practices at home to then show an audience what he mastered at home and like you just have to get up on stage and try to be in front of people mm -hmm. and fail 
and he, and then even apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I've apologized to audiences for doing bad. And like, there were times when I was mad at them, but there was also moments that I realized like, yeah, I did screw it up and here's why. A lot of times I was trying too hard mm. or, um, you know, I read the room. I thought they wanted dirt, dirtier, crasser jokes than they did and they, they did not. <laughs> And uh, I don't know. So it's a very learn by doing thing mm -hmm. for me. Yeah, that makes sense. I, I guess it's like you can't really practice. Well, I mean, you can practice on your own, but you don't yeah. you don't get any feedback on if your jokes are landing or not, unless you're in front of an audience. So it's really kind of putting yourself out there in the unknown. Yeah. Mm hmm um yeah and it is frustrating it's um I, I talk about how the two biggest rules of comedy are juxtaposition and surprise mm -hmm. and part of the surprising juxtaposition of that is that comedy is hard and it shouldn't be but it is <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry that you're frustrated that comedy is hard but it's supposed to be mm -hmm. yeah i feel like that's kind of the case with any creative endeavor like um at least what i found going back to sort of music which i feel like has some intersection mm -hmm. there was a point in time where i was making these these verses that were like really tons of wordplay and, oh, and yeah. looking back they're like impenetrable absolutely impossible to understand anything that's going on and not that clever at all but right. in the, at the time i was like this is so clever like this is why am i not getting sort of the the praise that i want from this and it right. took me a long time to, to recognize that like, okay, I have two choices. I can either change what I'm doing to get like, you know, sort of the reactions I want. I can mold it a little bit closer to what people actually like, mm -hmm. or I can keep making what I think is cool and just deal with whatever feedback comes back its own separate way. Yeah. And, you know, obviously there's, there's one direction that you can go too far, which is like sort of, you're a sellout now, but, um, you know, yeah. there's also a piece of like, um, not at least for me in, in my creative process on this part will like not being so tightly tied to like what I think is cool. And in the same way, if I was doing comedy, be like, this is what I think is funny. Why is no one laughing at this? I'm going to just keep doing this joke until people start laughing at it. Like that's oh, never yeah. going to work. Okay. I can, I can give you a technical thing about that specifically. What mm -hmm. uh, you just said is in that it's sometimes when you say something, it's funny and it is funny to you and it isn't funny to anyone else. You haven't proved enough in either your setup or punchline mm. why is why it's funny to you. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that maps right back to the music thing I was saying because uh, I did have yeah. some clever stuff, but mm -hmm. it wasn't it wasn't set up in a way that it made any sense. Like it didn't pop in the right way, right? It was like buried in there in the exact oh, yeah. same way. Um yeah, music is hard too. I don't know. I feel musical, but I'm not a musician. Um, Me too. That's seen... why I rap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> have you seen uh, Have you seen Tick Tick Boom on Netflix? Mm -mm. Oh, I'm not a musical theater fan. This is a, a story based on. It's a true story based on the guy who wrote Rent, and Andrew Garfield plays him, who I I guess wasn't a singer. Supposedly learned to sing for this movie. I I don't know if that's oh. completely true, oh, cool. but he's incredible. And um, I don't know, I'm not a musical theater fan, but Tick, Tick, Boom is incredible. Um, I don't know, I'm telling all musicians. The fact, <laughs> that, the fact that I not a, not a musical theater fan could have been sort of like swept up in it. And also it's about a struggling artist and it's about a New Yorker. So it's like, it's very just identifiable to me. But um, I don't know, I'm excited for the fact that I was surprised at how much I liked it, uh, like the music of it. I, and I've never even seen Rent. I mean, I know it's a beloved production. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen it. Mm -hmm. I recognize clips of it, you know. Um, but yeah, Tick, Tick, Boom was great. And do you have any music <laughs> recommendations? No, oh, I unfortunately am not as much in that circle as oh, I yeah. as I used to be. That's I mean anything recent or recent or I mean anything recent or new. 
I, so I don't have I don't have a good answer for it. It's actually oh, yeah. it's actually one of the one of the lamest parts of of my life that I have to figure out how to reintegrate. Which is I used to do a lot of music stuff and I used to really like it. Oh and then yeah. I switched from what I was doing into software and software oh, yeah. is extremely difficult. So it took all my time and energy to learn how to do that over the past I don't know four or five years. And then I can't listen. I can't have any lyrics going on while I'm trying to write code because I'll be oh, so yeah. distracted. Yeah. So I can't even I have people... stuff out the window. Like, yeah. I can't even have people talk to me while I'm cooking. And I'm yeah. like, not a great <laughs> chef. and like, because I'm not a great chef, it's like, mm. um, can, can you give me a minute so I can concentrate on these eggs? <laughs> yep. So I'm finally starting to get to the point where I'm not like panic a hundred percent of the time. Like, Oh my God, yeah. how does any of this work? How do I do my job? <laughs> oh Yeah. So I'm just starting to uh, find some space for the music stuff again, which oh, yeah. is the long-winded answer to, I don't have any good music recommendations okay. for you right I'll now. You a, I'll give you a second one or I'll, I'll go twice then. It's, and it's, um, and ugh, I'm going to have my friends listen to this and they're going to make a mental wars joke about how I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm running the game and I'm going twice on this. Anyway, um, just look up YouTube chill hop mix. Chill hop. Okay. Yeah. Or look on Spotify for Chill Hop. There, it's just like a playlist. Usually there's no lyrics in the songs. I don't know. It's like great chill out music. Nice. Cool. The internet good. is smart. It, they, they're you know they're rewarding you for just searching for what you want. Cool. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks for the recommendations. Yeah. Um, before, before we wrap up for today, do you have anything to plug or anything else to share? Yeah. Okay. Well, I guess I'm going to work on that dog uh, comedy album. Uh, that's going to be, that's yeah. going to be a winner. <laughs> I'll put that out on Spotify uh, maybe this month or maybe, you know, in okay. the next few months. Yeah. Let, okay. let us know. Um, and then you, people can find me at seanwickens.com or uh, on Instagram at S H W I C K E N S Wickens. Cool. Yeah. And we'll, we'll put those links in the description if they want to check out your stuff. And yeah. I totally agree. Like my, well, I haven't figured out what, but I feel like if you can break into the, the dog industry, because people are like obsessed with their dogs yes. and are willing to spend money. <laughs> money. It's like, that's a good way to go. So yeah. I'm actually very like legit. Whenever you release that, I'm I'm excited to, to send it to my dogs to listen to it. Perfect. So. And we'll see how Donovan's girlfriend's cat likes it. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. If, maybe maybe you'll <laughs> branch into cats later down maybe. the line. <laughs> this dog thing goes well. Yeah. All right. Well, Sean, thank you so much for joining us on our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you everyone for tuning in. We appreciate you. If you appreciate us, be sure to like, comment, subscribe and spread the happiness in the world. All right, we'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like it and then go and subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so you get notified when the next video comes out. If you check out in the description below, go to my website where you can get my free fast and easy guide to stress relief. Thanks again for checking us out and we'll see you next time. <laughs>